the city. In the wake of disaster, you are about to enter upon probably the most difficult and yet most important period of your life, when to escape the effects of radioactive fallout for perhaps as long as the next two weeks, you will be deprived of all the conveniences of modern life, when you will live under crowded conditions, almost elbow to elbow with your neighbor, when your diet, your personal hygiene, and other habits will undergo drastic change until the passage of time has decayed radioactive substances and fallout to a point where it will be safe for you to take up your life where you left it. the city, throughout our nation, many millions of people have embarked upon the same experience in survival, aware of the location of the nearest public shelter. Know where this sign is in your neighborhood, for it designates public and privately owned buildings being used for community shelters, marked and licensed with the consent of their owners, and pre-stocked by the federal government with austere supplies for its occupants for a two-week period. Food. Water. Sanitation supplies. Medical kits. Radiological monitoring equipment. In sum, just enough supplies to meet your basic needs to sustain your life. It is quiet in the suburbs. In the wake of disaster, you and members of your family are entering upon your own experience in survival, in your own home shelter. Pre-stocked with food and water supplies, enjoying certain comforts denied those who will live out this period in a public shelter. But wholly dependent on your own decisions, in fact, strictly on your own, for your existence until it is safe for you to leave the shelter. In both situations, the public shelter and the home shelter, the principles of healthful living are the same. This film will show you what you may expect in shelter living. It will examine important principles of sanitation and hygiene which, if adhered to, will mean that you can emerge from an abnormal period of crowded living more than just alive. Instead, ready and physically able to work with your neighbors to restore your normal way of life. When you go to the public shelter, don't bring too many things with you. However, if you're the parent of an infant child, you'll have to bring formulas and other baby foods. And if you have certain dietary needs, you'll have to bring these special foods along, although they should be foods that do not require cooking. In fact, don't bring anything that needs cooking. That also goes for perishable foods. They'll have to be left outside with the shelter manager faced with the problem later on of what to do with them. In short, the less you bring to the public shelter, the better. your home for perhaps the next two weeks. Not all community shelters will look the same or be outfitted the same. Some will have bunks or cots. Some will provide blankets. Some may have, in addition to the austere food and water supplies provided by the federal government, supplementary supplies along with the means of preparing and serving them. Nevertheless, Though there is no standard interior or uniform provisioning for the public shelter, there will be, even in minimal conditions, the essentials to get you through this most important period. 
waiting out decay of dangerous radioactive fallout from a nuclear disaster. You've unpacked, taken your bearings. But almost as soon as you've settled down, your youngsters, just as on every other outing, begin to complain of thirst. What do you do for water in a public shelter? Each of these containers holds 70 quarts of drinking water, with 10 drums provided for this 50-person capacity shelter. That means you and everyone else will be allotted three and one-half gallons of drinking water during your shelter stay. Divide 14 days into three and a half gallons, and your daily allotment will be little over one quart of water for drinking purposes. However, it's the responsibility of the shelter manager to decide just how much you will receive. In fact, any water inside the building is safe for drinking purposes if the water from outside has been shut off. The moment everyone is waiting for, lunch. If you have brought infant foods, they can be warmed by exposing their containers directly to body heat. As for your own lunch, your main and probably only dish in a federally stocked shelter will be no different from what you've had for breakfast or dinner. A simple diet, easy to fix, and no dishes to wash. In short, a biscuit similar in taste and appearance to a graham cracker. With enough nutritional value to supply you with slightly more than 700 calories per day, sufficient to keep you going during your inactive shelter life. This being your first day in the shelter, the usual ration is supplemented by perishable fruits brought by some of the occupants, washed and peeled to eliminate danger of contamination. However, don't bank on this as a steady treat. Chances are your daily menu will consist solely of the biscuit. In the home shelter, the family has stocked its water supply beforehand. Sealed containers of various types storing water indefinitely. Enough to provide each member of the family with two quarts each day. With the average healthy adult drinking one quart of water daily during the shelter stay. But there are ways to supplement this home shelter water supply. For example, canned or bottled soft drinks, as well as milk, soups, fruit juices, and liquids from canned fruits and vegetables. However, at the first warning of possible disaster, the family head took a number of precautions to ensure an even larger backup to the home shelter water supply. On the alert signal, I knew I had certain things to do. First, turn off the main water intake valve controlling the water supply into our home so that water contaminated by fallout would not be drawn into our household system. Next, to permit the free flow of water in our system, opening the hot water faucet very slightly in our top floor bathroom, a means of allowing air to leak in, thus releasing water at lower levels. Even before those steps, however, I would turned off the gas to our basement hot water tank. Most homes have a 30 to 40 gallon reserve supply of water. Still another source of pure water, about five gallons in each of our toilet storage tanks. Water in the bowl, of course, is not safe for drinking. Melted ice cubes. In an emergency, even this would help. And so, though our community water supply might become contaminated by fallout, my family, I felt, was protected. So far, so good. But what about the food supply for the home shelter? 
I'd carefully prepared for an emergency such as this. Stocking our shelter from normal food supplies kept in the kitchen cupboard. A variety of canned and packaged foods. Everything from meats to vegetables, soups and milk. In fact, various kinds of beverages. Packaged goodies for the youngsters. Foods to be rotated every one to three years to keep their taste and nutritional value and enough for a two-week supply for each member of our family. This being our first day in the shelter, to keep up our spirits, I planned a normal meal. Later on, we'd cut down our food intake, though our meals would be on a regular schedule. By setting a routine, it would give us something to look forward to and at least one hot meal a day, along with a hot drink of some kind. Though it wasn't necessary to heat or cook most of our already prepared food. Too much cooking can cause problems in the home shelter. water. But now the need arises for a third essential. Sanitation, or more bluntly, toilet facilities. Let's face up right now to some unpleasant facts. In both public and home shelter living, with water in scarce supply, human waste can't be flushed away by pressure on a handle. Used instead is a throwback to the old-fashioned privy, but now located inside your shelter. Actually, a chemical toilet with a plastic container. The sanitation kit of the federally marked shelter provides materials for assembly of a chemical toilet, complete with toilet tissue, waterless hand cleaner, deodorant, polyethylene bag, also